Amen. If you have your Bibles with you, we're going to be in Luke 22 as we finish up this chapter. We're getting very close to the end of the Gospel of Luke. And uh, it's, it's taken a little bit of time, but it's been good to walk through the life and ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, salvation in Jesus Christ is a glorious thing. You talk with a, a believer and somebody especially who's been saved for a little while, and they'll tell you about the joy that it has been, especially if you find them in an upswing of a season, and say it's so good to know the Lord, to have salvation, forgiveness of sins, the peace that God gives, and all of that. And then you almost have trouble understanding, at least I do, why so many people would say no to the Lord. Once you're on this side of it and you've experienced his goodness, it's hard to imagine that anybody would say no. But the majority, the Bible teaches, and we'll look there in a second, the majority of people who hear the gospel message, the Bible says, broad is the way that leads to destruction. And it's sad to think that there's more people who will reject the Lord than to receive him. You know, I have family and friends, you probably do too, that have rejected the Lord. And I know that I've preached to people, and they've not accepted him. I've spoken to people one-on-one, -on -one, whether by chance or by appointment, and they've turned away. And I've watched them not come back. And it's, it's painful, especially when you consider their end. Right? It's not just they don't want to come to church on Sundays. It's not just they don't agree with some of the things that I believe. But there are eternal consequences to rejecting the Lord. Death, hell, forever. And they're going to be there knowing that they could have, but that they refuse to do so. It, it confuses me. Does it confuse you why so many people reject the Lord? Um, forgiveness of sins, eternal life, peace with God, uh, that companion to cheer and guide, as the Bible says. And you say, what are they holding out for? Are they holding out for a better offer? I mean, what, what, are, what exactly is it that they are looking for? The sad thing is, when people choose sin, they never decide and just actively say, I choose sin. They're like, no, I've looked at my options between sin and God, and I've chosen sin. What it is, is they're choosing what they think will make them happy. They're choosing what it is that they think will make them safe or comfortable. We see this same confusing rejection among the most religious people of Jesus' day. So let's visit on the night before Jesus uh, goes to the cross, and there's a sham of a trial that's conducted here. And in Luke chapter 22, Luke chapter 22 and verse number 63, the word of God says this, and the men that held Jesus mocked him and smote him. And when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face and asked him saying, prophesy, who is it that smote thee? And many other things blasphemously they there spoke they against him and as soon as it was day the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together and led him into their council saying art thou the christ tell us and he said unto them if i tell you ye will not believe and if i also ask you you will not answer me nor let me go Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Then said they all, Art thou then the Son of God? And he said unto them, You say that I am. And they said, What need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. Let's pray together. Father, in this hour, as we go to your word, we don't just want to study a text, we want to hear from you. We want to be led and we want to be changed by your spirit. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen. So Jesus has been betrayed by Judas. They found the time when the crowds that were swarming him in Jerusalem weren't around there to lend the protection because the crowds loved Jesus, but Jesus' enemies among the religious elite, among the council that's called the, the Sanhedrin, uh, the chief priests and the, the temple guards, they all saw Jesus as a threat. And so they wanted to destroy him. That was their plan. And so they had to find a time to get him. And so they used Judas in order to find a time when Jesus would be alone in the evening. And indeed, they found him in a place where he often went to pray. And they arrested him and they dragged him off to the house of the high priest. And he's held captives, held as a captive by the guards. And they begin to mistreat him. Look in verse number 63. And the men that held Jesus mocked him. 
You know, they were holding him captive. They had arrested him. This is meaning that they were holding Jesus in custody. And when they say that they mocked him, what it was is they were pretending for him to be something that he really wasn't, right? And what we're going to find out is they had heard that he was a prophet. They had heard that he was claiming that he was the Messiah. And so now they thought it would be funny to treat him as though he was the Messiah or to treat him as though he was the prophet, but to do so in a mocking, shameful way. The irony was... He actually was what they were pretending he was, right? Uh, the Romans are going to do the same thing, and they're going to dress him up like a king because they're going to say, oh, well, he said he was the king of the Jews, and they're going to mock him. But in all reality, that's exactly what he was. So they were all picking on him as though he was not, but they were saying these mocking words. They did not believe him. It says not only did they mock him in verse 63, but they smote him, meaning that they beat him repeatedly. They beat him repeatedly. And the thing that gets me is that he endured it, but he was never helpless. He endured it, but he was never helpless. Look in Matthew chapter 26, would you? Matthew chapter 26. That's the part that gets me. If someone is treating me like this, me, humanly speaking, if someone is speaking to me like this, and I had this power, I would use it. But you see, as the perfect son of God, he knew that what he was doing to step into our place, to die for us and as us, was so important that he was going to do so anyway. But it says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 53, Thinkest thou that I cannot now pray to my father, and he shall presently give me more than twelve legions of angels? But how then shall the scriptures be fulfilled, that thus it must be? This is a conversation that's happening when Jesus is under arrest and he's reminding his disciples that some of them wanted to put up a physical fight and stop Jesus from being taken into custody. And Jesus was saying, this needs to be. And by the way, I don't need your help. I could ask for 12 legions of angels. You know, a legion has over 6,000 people and then about 5,500 of those people would be fighting men in a Roman legion. And he said, legions of what? Angels. Now, I want you to think back to the military power of an angel. I want you to think back. Two angels destroyed two city-states, Sodom and Gomorrah, right? An angel is a powerful creature, something created by God to do the work of the Lord, given power to fulfill his will. Can you imagine what a legion of angels could do? Do you remember? I remember being a kid and, and having people talk about how there's so many nuclear weapons in the world that we could destroy the world X number of times. Do you remember that conversation? I, I don't know why we as kids, we thought anything military was cool. And it's like, how many more times do you need to destroy the world than once, right? But it's like, well, this country has enough nuclear weapons to do it this many times, but we have enough to do it this many times. Once you start talking about legions of angels, you've crossed that line, right? You're not just talking about the destructive capability to ruin a planet, but all of creation, so Jesus was saying at no point was he not able to call in divine power to rescue himself. And yet as they mocked him, as they beat him, he endured it. What an amazing savior who would go through that for you and for me. Amen. It wasn't some clean, sterile, clinical type process. He was delivered into the hands of sinners. And you see what they would do when they could get their hands on God. Right? You see what they would do when they could get their hands on God. This is what they would do. They would mock him, they wouldn't recognize him, and that they would beat him. Verse 64, back in our passage, verse 64 in Luke 22, it says that they blindfolded him. And when they, had blind, when they had blindfolded him, they struck him on the face. Now, I, I've never... Have you, have you ever seen somebody do something that it was so silly... Like one of, my, one of my children and I, we'd be wrestling and they'd jump on top and be like, ha, I've got you held down. And you know, at any moment, you could just toss them off, right? It, was Jesus in any way hindered by being blindfolded? No, no. no human attempt to restrain God has ever worked one iota, one amount. Jesus knew what was in the heart of man. In fact, he could read the thoughts. He knew exactly what was going on. He knew where people were before he even saw them. Some of the disciples, he's like, I, I saw you when you were out there by yourself underneath the juniper tree, and you said, whoa, no one was around. How did you know that? J blindfolding Jesus was in no way going to restrain his power. 
and they insultingly hit him in the face. And here's where we see that mockery come in. And they struck him on the face and asked him, saying, Prophesy, who is it that smote thee? So you have these temple guards that are roughing him up, and they blindfolded him. They've covered his face so he can't see. And then they're all gathered around him, and they're hitting him in the face in an insulting manner. And they're like, well, he's a prophet, so he should be able to have this divine knowledge and tell us things that nobody else knows. Uh, and so here's the knowledge we want from you, prophet. Tell us which one hit you. And another would hit him. Which one hit you now? Oh, who hit you now? Who was it? You know what? Jesus could have not just said which guard had hit him at that time, but could have listed every single thing that all of those men had done, good and evil. Because the eyes of the Lord are everywhere, beholding the evil and the good. He knows all things. And yet he still submitted himself to this and was silent as he did so. It says that they were blaspheming him. Verse 65, and many other things blasphemously they spake against him. The word blasphemy really means to speak evil of, right? It's defamation. But when we think about it in the sense of the Bible, it is always, in worded or in deed, injurious or dishonoring or defiant towards God. That's what they were doing. They were dishonoring God. They were defiantly speaking against him. And it was to God's face. And it wasn't just one thing that they did that was blasphemous. It was many things. I don't know who you work with. I don't know who you live with. I don't know who lives near you or who's in your friend group. But I am guessing you hear from time to time people blaspheme the name of our Lord. Right? How many of you hear people blaspheme the name of our Lord? Right? They, they turn his name into a swear word. Right? The most precious name that has ever existed, belonging to the most precious Savior, and yet they would take his name and they'd use it like a swear word. Or uh, they, they, would, they would use crude words and give him uh, vile or wicked middle names in saying his name. Or they would speak uh, wickedly about who God is. I hope that you as a Christian say something. I hope that you as a Christian say something. If you're a believer, I hope you make everybody around you uncomfortable because you say something. One of my favorite things when someone yells Jesus Christ and they're not talking about the Lord... You know, and it usually throws people for a loop when they say Jesus Christ. And I say, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. And they're like, what's with the crazy guy, right? But if you need something a little more, uh, a little more palatable or mundane, you know, everything's about, you know, let's not offend anyone today and say, hey, please, that's the name of my Lord. Would you not use his name like that? That offends me. You say, people are going to treat me different. They're going to look at me different. I'm going to create all sorts of problems for myself. Good. It means we're standing up for something when we have opposition. So don't let someone speak the, uh, evil about the name of the Lord. And you know what's crazy? I have friends that are unsaved, and I've known them since high school, and they keep from doing a lot of swearing around me out of, out of kindness, but they feel like it's no big deal to take the, the Lord's name as though he's like on the bottom rung of swear words, using his name as a pejorative or an exclamatory remark, whereas I, would, I don't want them to cuss at all, but if they had to ask me a choice, leave his name out of it. Leave his name out of it. He did so much and continues to do so much for us. I hope you speak up when people speak blasphemy, blasphemously of the Lord Jesus. Well, they get the council together, verse number 66. And as soon as it was day, the elders of the people and the chief priests and the scribes came together. The law prohibited them from having any kind of trial at night, so they went and arrested Jesus at night, and they held him captive, and they mocked him, and they beat him, and they blasphemed him. But as soon as it was day, they called together the Council of Elders, or what is often referred to as the Sanhedrin, which is the, pretty much the highest court in the land. This is the final court of appeals. If the Jewish nation finds you guilty of something inside of the Sanhedrin, you're guilty of it. There's no one else you can go to inside the Jewish nation um, perhaps if you're a Roman citizen, you could appeal out of it. But what did they want to do with this trial? What did they want to do? Flip back over to Matthew. Here's what they wanted. Matthew chapter 27. Matthew chapter 27 and verse number 1. When the morning was come, all the chief priests and elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. Does that sound like a very fair trial to you? 
That doesn't sound like a very fair trial to me. The whole purpose of them putting him on trial was so that they could have a way to get rid of him. They wanted to have a legitimate way to get rid of him, and they wanted to do it in such a way where the crowds would not come after them. The crowds would not come after them. And in verse number 26, or chapter 26, if you want to jump back in Matthew 26, uh, verses 59 and 60, it says, verse 59 of Matthew 26, Now the chief priests and elders and all the council sought false witness against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. Yea, though many false witnesses came, yet found they none. At the last came two false witnesses. And it goes on to speak about how they were trying to find something that Jesus had said. Again, these are very moral religious people, aren't they? Before the trial even comes, they know that they're going to try and put him to death. And they really didn't care what he did or didn't do. He had to go. And so they brought false witnesses, many false witnesses, and they lied about the things that Jesus said, but none of what they said corroborated with each other. They couldn't lock anything down because of what these witnesses had said. And so now they wanted Jesus to confess with his own mouth what it is he'd done. So back in Luke chapter 22, in verse 67, they ask him this question. They say, art thou the Christ? Tell us. Art thou the Christ? Tell us. Now, this sounds like a perfect opportunity for Jesus to preach the good news to them. But I want you to know, they don't really care whether or not Jesus is the Christ. In fact, he's just going to say that here in a moment. What they want is something to use against him. And they thought if they could get him to own up to trying to be the Messiah, even after they have officially rejected him as the Messiah, and he's trying to portray himself that way, they could get rid of him. You see, Messiah figures were actually very dangerous to the Jewish religious leadership. Why? For a couple of reasons. One, if it came from without of their power structure, people loved the idea of the Messiah coming, but he threatened the power of the establishment. He threatened the Sanhedrin and all of their control. The other thing is the Romans don't like it when a Messiah comes because it stirs up all the people to try and throw off Roman rule. The Jewish people had some control over their land, but they were a Roman province. They had been conquered and passed from nation to nation to nation with very small periods of freedom. They were part of different empires. And so the, the Romans, they oftentimes had to put down or had the Jewish leaders put down these false messiahs. And so if they could get Jesus to own it, then they could destroy him. They could destroy him. Verse 67, the second part of it. They say, art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, if I tell you, ye will not believe. And if I also ask you, you will not answer me, nor let me go. See, they weren't legitimately asking a question. They didn't care whether or not he was the Christ. They had already decided that he was going to go. And this is the thing that boggles the mind. Who knew the Old Testament better than these people? The scribes and the chief priests. Who knew the Old Testament any better than them? No one, right? They had to memorize it. They had to teach it. Who do you think knew the prophecies associated with the Messiah better than these? I mean, humanly speaking, they should have been the most clued in to who Jesus was because of how much they had been given. They had been given, as the Bible calls it in the New Testament, the oracles of God. They'd been revealed to some things that the Gentiles didn't get to know. They should have been completely aware of what happened. And Jesus said, it doesn't matter what I say to you, you don't want to believe. And so you won't. In fact, the, the wording here, it says, ye will not believe. That's one of the strongest ways that you could say that sentence in the way that Jesus would have spoken. There's, there's actually two no's in there. Like, you will really not, right? In English, two no's cancel each other out. Here, they just multiply. He says, you're not going to believe. You're not going to believe. And maybe you've talked with someone about the gospel, and they just refuse to believe. I mean, no matter what you say, no matter what you come up with, they don't want to believe. They don't want to believe. Um, look in John chapter 3. Here's, here's a little bit of, the, of why people don't want to believe. In John chapter 3, verse 
Verse number 17. For God sent not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He that believeth on him is not condemned, but he that believeth not is condemned already, because he hath not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. And this is the condemnation, that light is come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. The Pharisees, the other members of the Sanhedrin, they had gone so far down the path that they had gone that they were unwilling to turn around and consider that they might be wrong. And in fact, if they were wrong, then the things that they did were not just wrong, they were evil. They were dark. They were sinful. And when people do something that's wrong, they want to hide it. They want to try and clear away all traces that they ever did that thing. They want to pretend like they'd never done anything wrong. They tell everyone the things that they're supposed to tell them, and they act the way that they're supposed to act in order to keep anyone from knowing. And that's why people don't want to repent is because they have to admit that they're sinners. They have to admit that they're wrong. They have to admit that they've gone so far down this path, and everything that they've done down that path has not gotten them where they need to, and they're usually unwilling to go back the other way. There's a, a term in the business world where they call it sunk cost bias, right? I put so much money into this, I can't turn back now, even if it's a bad plan. How many of you have been a part of something at work where that happened? You're like, this isn't working, so let's do it harder and pay more money for it, right? Maybe you've seen something like that happen. Well, this is what happened with these, these Pharisees is they would not believe. They would not believe, no matter what Jesus said. He said, if I ask you about it, you're not going to have a conversation with me. And he says, you're not going to let me go. So what's even the point of you asking that question? Why are we even having this conversation? Matthew chapter 7 and verse number 13, part of the Sermon on the Mount. Jesus says this, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it. You've got two different ways here. You've got the way of destruction, which is broad, it's wide, it's open, and many people will go that direction. That's what Jesus teaches. And he said, the, the way to life, few people find it, because it's narrow. It's hard to find. You know, a pathway, I don't know if you ever go hiking. Any of you like to hike? Anybody here like to hike? I, I thought I liked to hike, and then when I was like 20-something, I liked to hike, and then I've gone hiking recently, and I realize I don't like it as much as I used to. I don't know why that is. But you can miss a path, can't you? Oh, we were supposed to turn off. A wide path is easy to find, but a narrow path is hard to find. That's sort of the picture, if you want to think about it in your head. They would have thought more about path through mountains and path through hills and things like that, but you can think about it like that. Jesus is teaching here to the multitude, saying the majority of people will end up rejecting Christ, and because of that, they go to destruction. That's the word that he uses here. It leads to destruction, and many there be that go in thereat. The sad truth is, of the people who have lived, or living, or will live, the majority of them will not trust Christ as Savior. That should be a grieving thought. That should be a grieving thought. It's a, it's a grieving thought for the Lord. He's not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance and be saved. Right? Christ tasted death for every man. It was his desire that many would come, but as we see, many rejected. Many rejected. Verse number 69. Jesus uses a certain term here, to sort of answer their question anyway, when they ask him, art thou the Christ? He says in verse 69, hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. He's saying, after all of this, whatever you're going to do, after the, this false trial, after the scourging, after the crucifixion, hereafter, what you're going to see is the Son of Man, which is the term, the messianic term that Jesus uses for himself to refer only to himself, that he shall be glorified and given a, power, a place of power and honor seated at the right hand of God. We don't, we don't think about the right hand and the left hand and things like that today, but if you could imagine a banquet 
and the host or the, the king or the lord of the banquet, whoever would be seated at his right hand, that was the most and highest honored position where you could sit. When we have parties today, when we have dinners today and banquets, we really don't normally worry about who's going to sit where except in a few occasions, right? When you go to a wedding and it has a nice big sit-down dinner, there's a special table, isn't there? Who goes to that table? Yeah, it's the wedding party, right? Bridesmaids, right? The groomsmen and the couple. And not just anybody gets to sit there. It's a, it's a place of honor. And usually you have to have the, the closest family closest to the table. And then the further you get away, it's acquaintances and stuff until all the way in the back, it's like your dad's work friends, right? That invited him to their kid's wedding. So, you know, you, you had to invite them to yours. So you, you have something like that if you want to think about it. Or do you remember being a kid at Thanksgiving and you got stuck at the kid's table, right? You got the food second. You had to wait longer. It was, it was one of those shaky card tables, right? Where if like anybody bumped it with its elbows, one of the legs could collapse at any moment, dump potatoes on the ground, right? There's only one way to get to the adult table too, and nobody wants that, right? Somebody's got to pass away. But it's more of a place of honor, and the kids get shoved wherever. So when he's talking about Jesus being sit on the right hand of the power of God, he is being given the highest place of honor by God himself. And they respond with this question. Then said they all, art thou then the son of God? So they were saying, are you the Christ? And he refers to himself saying, well, I am the son of man, saying, I am indeed the Messiah. And then they said, well, are you the son of God? And he said unto them, ye say that I am. And they said, what need we any further witness? For we ourselves have heard of his own mouth. That little phrase, ye say that I am, is an idiom that means yes. He wasn't being deceptive here. He wasn't trying to, well, you say that I am. I don't know. That's not, this was a, a declaration. If, if you were ever concerned or wondering if Jesus really meant it here, he did mean it. And they said, perfect, blasphemy, worthy of death. Now we can get rid of him. But it's not, and it's something that we got to get through our mind here, because Jesus was making himself equal with God, by saying that he was the son of God. Now, when we think of the son of someone, we think about someone lesser, don't we? Right? The, the son is lesser than the father. It's sort of a Western mindset. But in an Eastern mindset, in a Bible way of thinking, the son of a family is continu continuing that descendants, that line, that ancestry. They are equal to. So Jesus is not just making himself out to be the son of God, like one of the, you know, the, the gods, right, in the Greek and Roman Empire. They had kids with mortals. And that's where Hercules and all these stories and stuff came from in their myths, right? And they were lesser, they weren't as powerful as the, the big gods, right? That's not what Jesus was saying here. He was claiming from the Jewish mindset to be equal with God. You say that I am. Yes. Jesus knew himself that he was God. And Jesus claimed to be the Son of God, which leaves us with an interesting uh, problem for our friends that want to say that Jesus was a good man or a good teacher. Because a good man and a good teacher does not pretend to be God in the flesh. A good man and a good teacher does not pretend that he is the only way to heaven. Right? That is something that either it's true or it's not true. And if it's not true, let's say, for example, that it's not true, but Jesus thought that it was. He thought he was God, but he really wasn't. That would make him a lunatic, right? He's crazy. He thought he was God and he wasn't. Or if he wasn't God and he knew he wasn't God, but he was just pretending to fulfill this role as Messiah because he thought he could get ahead with it or something, that would make him a liar, but not a good man. So you're left with a Lord, the lunatic, or a liar, right? These are your only options with what Jesus has done and what he has said. So we can't just leave him as a good man because he's made claims that no good man would make. And so the council declared Jesus worthy of death, and that's something that they were not allowed to do. They had to appeal to the Romans for it. By Jesus' own testimony, he was condemned in their eyes, and yet all he did was acknowledge the truth. So how do we 
process and apply this, this cruelty that's shown to our Lord. The first thing is to revere the person and name of Christ. To revere the person and name of Christ. The soldiers mocked and blasphemed Jesus, and you and I, we often hear Jesus' name blasphemed like we were talking about before, as a swear word or just him being evil spoken of. Please don't do that yourself. Don't use Jesus' name as a mark of exclamation. Uh, don't, I would recommend that you don't even use uh, things that sound like it. Well, I didn't say Jesus, I said geez. Well, what do you think that's short for, right? I would say let's not use his name in any other way than thoughtful, intentional speech and a way where we honor it, right? So let's not use that, and let's not sit around while other people do it. Let's not sit around. If they speak wrongly, let's challenge them. Excuse me, but when you use my Lord's name like that, I am offended, which is the worst thing that anyone could be in the world today, apparently, right? People may not care that you're offended, but that seems to be the buzzword today. But it gives us an opportunity to speak up. And we say, why does that offend you, right? Because he's the one who died for me. He's God who became a man to save me from the mess that I had created for myself. And it gives you an opportunity to go right into the gospel and to explain. We well, see, Jesus died for me. He lived a sinless life, and yet he died, and he paid a punishment he shouldn't have had to pay. It was mine. And you can go through the whole thing about how he died and was buried and rose from the grave. I promise you that it will create a bit of a stir. It will create a bit of a stir. It may help you set out there whose side you're really on publicly, which is something every Christian needs to do. The time has, to speak up has come. The night is far past and the day is at hand, right? It's time to put on the armor of light. It's time to get out there and be out and out for the Lord Jesus. It also may get them to not speak like that around you again, either because they want to honor your beliefs or they're just worried that the weirdo is going to go off again if they say that, right? So either way, it could be good. It could be good. But let's revere the person and name of the Lord Jesus. The second thing is let's be prepared for multitudes to reject the Lord, right? And when I say to be prepared for multitudes to reject the Lord, um, I don't say, I say this so that you don't get discouraged, so that, I, so that I don't get discouraged, right? I'm always dismayed when somebody says no, right? You probably have at some point explained the gospel message to someone, and they just didn't want to hear it. They did not, and no matter what you said, they wouldn't hear it. We used to deal with a lot of international students at the University of Tennessee when I was back down there in Tennessee. That was one of our outreach ministries was to the refugees and to the... Um, the international students and international professionals. And the Chinese scientists were always very interested to learn about Christianity because it's very suppressed back where they're at. And it's odd to them that there are thinking, intelligent people that actually believe in Jesus because they've been taught that it's nonsense. And so they want to know when they get here and they have a little more freedom to ask about it and they don't have to worry about how it would stain their record if they asked about it in China. And we would oftentimes get to the place with these people where we would invite them to make a decision to trust Christ after we'd done Bible studies. And they say, well, I've still got questions. I'm not, I, I still got questions. And I say, well, what are your questions? And they would say, well, I'm just not sure. Well, what are you not sure about? Right? What it comes down to is they just plain old didn't want to believe because of the consequences. If they go back having become a Christian, it puts them in the crosshairs of their own government. It puts them at odds with a lot of their family. It may put them at odds with their friends. And those scientists that come over here on those government-appointed positions, they are required to come back and work a certain number of years in their field in China afterwards because that's, that's the deal. The government runs a lot of aspects of your life there. I share that with you to let you know that there are people that you can pour your heart out to and you can pray and you can work and they still have... A response to God. And they'll answer for how they choose to respond to the Lord. Some won't, but some will. Some won't believe, but some will believe. So don't stop sharing the gospel because you never know who it is that may come to Christ. You may look at somebody and say, oh, that's one of the people that will never believe, right? There were people who thought that about me. Oh, he'll never believe. He'll never change. He'll never accept Christ. Well, they were wrong, and I'm glad that they were, because God can do whatever he wants with whomever he wants, right? And God loves to take the unlikely 
and, and bring them to salvation and then to use them for his namesake. Don't lose heart. Keep sharing the gospel. They aren't rejecting you. They're rejecting the Lord. It can feel like they're rejecting you at times, but don't be surprised and don't give up. Don't give up. Be prepared for the multitudes to reject the Lord. The last thing here, our third application, is to believe that Jesus Christ is truly God. He's nothing less than. Uh, I know I've had people come and ask me and say, well, is Jesus really God? Because they don't want to get it wrong and be blasphemous. or like, I know he's the son of God, but does that really make him God? Look in John 10, if you would, please. In John 10, Jesus made some people very angry. Which is nothing new. John chapter 10 and verse 27. My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish. Neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. I and my Father are one. First of all, this is a great passage to look at if you've ever worried about losing your salvation. If you ever worried that I can mess up so bad or that the devil can make me do such things to where I'm going to lose it, right now it says here that you are held by the Lord Jesus and by God the Father and no one is greater than them and no one can pry you out of it, right? That includes you. You can't get out of it, right? If they're holding you, you're held. But what he said here is, I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up stones again to stone him. Now they're going to murder him in the street. They're going to enact mob justice on him by throwing large rocks from off the ground at him until he dies. That's a pretty, pretty intense punishment. But in the Bible, for blasphemy, for making yourself out to be God, it's punishable by death. And Jesus answered them, Many good works have I showed from my Father. For which of those works do you stone me? And the Jews answered him, saying, For a good work we stone thee not, but for blasphemy, and because thou, being a man, makest thyself God. You say, did Jesus really claim to be God? He did it so much so that his enemies knew what he was doing and were trying to enact the punishment against him for doing it. So you may hear some stuff out there where, well, Jesus never claimed to be God. Wrong. Wrong. He knew who he was, and he proclaimed it to people. He was the Messiah, he was the Son of Man, he is the Son of God. He fulfilled all of those roles. So accept nothing less when people talk about the Lord as fully being God. It says in Colossians chapter 2 in verse 8, Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit, after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. For in him dwelleth all the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And ye are complete in him, which is the head of all principality and power. How much of the Godhead dwells in Christ bodily? All of it, right? All the fullness of the Godhead bodily. And we are complete in him. We don't need anything or anyone else. So he's just as much God as God the Father or God the Spirit. So what that means is we honor him as God, and we refer to him as God, and we obey him as God right? Three persons, one in essence, a trinity. We trust his promises. So believe that Jesus Christ is truly God. What does blasphemy look like? And, and I'm not asking for um, colorful examples to be given here in church tonight, but what does blasphemy look like in modern life? Some of the things we already talked about as examples, but what does blasphemy look like in modern life? Okay. Yeah. We can speak evil of others, right? Blasphemy against people. What about blasphemy against the Lord? What does that look like? To evil speak of him. How do people dishonor him or set him at naught? Mm. Mm. You're like, it's too late in the day for this. Yes. Saying, oh my God, right? Or OMG, right? That's, pardon? The man upstairs. 
Yeah, it dishonors his character. What was that? The big guy, yes. And uh, it's even, he's so much better than all of those things. And I know when people refer to him like that, oftentimes they don't know much about God and they're trying, they're trying in some limited way with their limited understanding to speak, you know, sort of well of him. But they're like, well, somebody out there likes me. He is so much better than somebody out there. Just like when people say, oh, I'm sorry for your loss. Well, she's gone to a better place. He's gone to a better place. No, I mean, we live in Cleveland. There's a lot of places that are better than Cleveland, okay? That's a better place. We're talking about heaven, the presence of God, the fullness of joy, right? Pleasures forevermore. Uh, it's, it's more than just a better place, and he's more than just the man upstairs. So let's be careful about how we use his name and when other people use it like that. What are some of the reasons that people have given you for rejecting Jesus? Whether they even knew, perhaps they were saying they were rejecting him or not. Yeah, Tone? Yeah, I'm a good person. I hear that one a lot. Yeah. Not a sinner. You know what's weird? I didn't really believe I was a good person, but I didn't believe I was a sinner before I was saved. Isn't that kind of dumb? <laughs> well, if you're not a good person, what are you? Not bad. I don't know. Yes. Yes, if he's God, why is he letting things happen the way that they're happening, right? The problem of pain, the problem of suffering. There's been a lot of debate about that through the centuries. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, mm hmm. What other are reasons that people reject the Lord? Can't prove it. Hmm. Uh, and we've, we've come to a place where it doesn't matter if you can prove it or not. It's weird. It's weird. I, I, was, I was trained in seminary how to use different aspects of, you know, I can talk about the logic of God existing, and I can talk about the archaeological evidence of, of the things in the Bible, and you can talk about, you know, the, the promises that God made and how it's a solid framework and how it answers all of the questions and it's most likely to be true. And then my experiential things. And I've sat down and I have talked with people for hours and afterwards they're just like, that doesn't resonate with me. And I just want to flip the table and be like, what? You know, um, people are at a place now where it doesn't matter if you can prove things because facts are no longer a thing. Did you know that? Fact checkers, they can change whatever they want and Everyone gets their own version of truth, and it's, it's enraging because you're like, I just set out all of these logical arguments on why God is real and why the Bible is true, and they're just like, I don't like that, so it's not true. And you want to say you can't do that, but we've, we've reached that place in our society now where feelings trump everything, logic or everything else. So those are some of the the bad, what do you think the genuine reasons behind all of that are? What do you think the genuine reasons behind? Because some of those things are, are pretty weak. Yeah, Tony? Selfish. Selfish? Yeah. I know for me, it was pride. It was pride. I just thought I was good enough and I didn't need it. Men love darkness because they're deep. Yeah. Men love darkness rather than light because their deeds are evil. Yeah. What are some of the common misconceptions about the identity of Jesus? What are some of the common misconceptions about the identity of Jesus? Who do people mistakenly think him to be today? A good teacher? Okay, just a prophet, but not God. J Jim? Santa Claus. Santa Claus. It sounds silly, but they, they mistake God for Santa Claus for adults. Yeah. All grace, no wrath, no judgment. All grace, no wrath, no judgment. You could turn that around, couldn't you? Some people think he's all wrath, all judgment, and no grace. People that hate God oftentimes make him out to be like that. The same people that say the thing about pain and suffering and how I can't believe in a God that sends people to hell or that allows natural disasters and all of this. Yeah. What else are some misconceptions? Yes, 
The Bible's... Mm-hmm. Hmm. Yeah. That's good. <laughs> In a world that's all relative truth. It's a bold claim. Hmm. Tony? I think they uh, take Christianity to something that can make them feel better about themselves. Mm. Yeah. It's just kind of like meditation or yoga. You know, it just kind of helps you relax. And if saying a prayer makes you feel calm, then it's a good thing. There's no reality behind it. But hey, if that's what you need in order to get through the day, go with it. Yeah. Yeah, superstitious. Art thou the Christ? Tell us. And he said unto them, If I tell you, you will not believe. And if I also ask you, ye will not answer me, nor let me go. Hereafter shall the Son of Man sit on the right hand of the power of God. Let's bow our heads and pray together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that we do know truth, that you've revealed yourself to us. I thank you that you've given us a standard by which to live and to know what's right and wrong and true and false ought to be done and ought not to be done. We thank you that you are the true and living God and that the Lord Jesus is God and he's our Lord and our Savior. Father, let us speak up, let us stand up, let us have courage to say things that perhaps have repercussions towards us but honors you. Let us stand as your children, unashamed. In Jesus' name, amen.